Okay. All right. Um, I move for a second or two minutes. Councilor Valeski, Councilor Ashford, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held March 19th, 2024 be approved and circulated. Any discussion or comments on the meeting's minutes? No? All in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you. And so we're skipping that part and then we're going right to correspondence. Thank you. There's a lot. <clears throat> Where the, there are, yes, there's a number of items of correspondence. Uh, the first is from the, C, the Perry Sound Seniors Club requesting relief from parking restrictions on Saturday, April 20th for an event. There, this is uh, providing that relief is at council's discretion. There is a, a resolution prepared to provide that relief if council wishes to entertain that. The second item is from Mary Jane Zissoff, representing Trilogy of Art. Ms. Zissoff um, notes that this year in May, there will be a dedication of Yvonne Williams Park, a plaque uh, installed there, and she is asking that the town coordinate with um, members of Ms. Zissoff's family who would be who would like to be present and who have authenticated checks for the plaque. So this item will be uh, referred to to the Parks and Recreation Department for that, that coordination. Now the uh, next uh, items there are twenty one items of correspondence from. Um, representatives, individuals, and in, in a couple cases representing organizations around, mainly around the Southern Georgia Bay Area, Meaford, Clarksburg, Midhurst, Blue Mountains, Southampton, Great Highlands, Maxwell, um, all citing concerns with the TC Energies Ontario Pump Storage Project. And council may recall that there was a resolution passed in opposition to TC Energies OPS and Terra Pump Storage at a previous meeting earlier this year. Um, both TC Energy and uh, St. George and Bay are here this evening to provide deputations to council with information. So the 21 letters that are included, I won't go into any great de detail of any one, but they cite environmental concerns, um, concerns for various species at risk and endangered species, concerns regarding ordinance, remaining in either former or current uh, national defense properties, health and safety concerns for both human and animal species, um, questioning of the long-term benefits to the local economy and the cost effectiveness of the project and claims that the technology is out of date. So those that's the information generally in those, in those 21 items of correspondence and that concludes the correspondence at all. Okay, thank you. The, the resolution on the parking, is that included in this or is that half the asphalt? The resolution was prepared. It's not on the agenda, but it has been prepared and moved and seconded. Okay. All right. So we'll go to deputations. I'm going to remind everyone that deputations are um, 10 minutes. So hopefully everyone does their their presentation streamlined and, and ready. And then there will be an opportunity for questions as well. Um, now our first deputation is with Eric McIntyre. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. That, maybe you'll miss the
I'd like to thank council very much for allowing uh, my wife and I to appear before you this evening. Uh, the matter being over the written deputation that we submitted at the March 5th meeting regarding radio uh, water meters. Uh, I, first of all, I don't want to appear before you as a crabby old man who has an unsubstantiated uh, ax to grind. Rather, I'd like to come before you one with uh, data, facts, that bear out sound reasoning. I've made three requests to the town for a project description business case with respect to the water read meter project, and I've received no response. So I have no data that the town has submitted. We do, have, we do, however, have data for the last 12 years for which we have been uh, billing data that we have received from the town. I'd like to point out that over the past 10 years, we have consumed 22,017 gallons of water as per the Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, over the past 10 years, we've consumed 22,017 gallons of water for an annual consumption of 2,202 gallons per year. If you, you take a, uh, an annual usage charge based on 0 0.89 cents per gallon, which is the charge that we have been levied upon us for the past three years, we are paying on average $19.59 a year our water charge. Let's say 20 bucks to make it easy for calculation. Peculiar, however, is the fact that when I was calculating the water usage charge rate as for the second table, the middle table, you can see that for the past few years, it has been consistently at 0 0.89 cents per gallon for three years. Prior to that, however, the water usage charge rate varies considerably. This was totally perplexing to me. And the reason became apparent when I looked at our bills and you, if you look at the lower table, prior to June 2021, we were not charged according to our usage rate. We were charged a flat rate, notwithstanding that we have a water meter. This was totally perplexing to me. And, and you will see that the in the lower table, the water usage charge the area outside of the gray portion, which represents when we are being charged, when we're being charged consistently at 0.89 uh, cents per liter, the 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 our water usage charge is is consistent, flat. For instance, in 2020, 22.27 for March, 22.39 for June, 22.39 for September, and 22.39 for December. Inexplicably. We have had a water meter for 12 years, of which nine, we've been charged a flat rate. Uh, th this was completely uh, news to me, like probably like a lot of rate payers. I get my bill, I look at the amount at the bottom, sign a check, send it in, and it's done. But inexplicably, we've been charged for nine years at a flat rate, notwithstanding we have a meter. Now, this is really uh, uh, tangential to the whole issue of our objection to the water meter being changed, but nevertheless, uh, an apparent anomaly, which I thought the council would be certainly interested in. Going back to the top table, our annual water usage charge based on 0 0.89 cents per gallon is $20 a year. If the water meters are in error, 30%, that would result in the town receiving $6 less than what it should if the water meters were reading correctly. If the error is 20%, the town receives $4 left. If it's 10%, they receive $2 left. We find it hard to understand that the town is threatening to turn off our water over a matter in which the pecuniary interest of the town amounts to five to $6 a year. And we are happy to pay that. 
We are happy to pay that. There is a method a lot simpler than the uh, intrusive, uh, complex, and expensive method of going in and switching out meters. We presume that the town is well aware of what the error is. Simply take our water usage reading, multiply it by a correction factor so that you get the uh, uh, presumed uh, total use of the total consumption that we're using. If, for example, it's a 25% error, multiply our, our, our gallons used by 1.25 and you've got a correction error, or, uh, a correction factor. This seems so much easier than going in and the intrus intrusion and the expense of switching out water meters. I won't go any further, I won't uh, belabor the point of um, the, the uh, excuse me, the um, um, uh, leakage that was the other reason that uh, we've been given for this project. But surely if you can correct the readings for uh, charges, you can correct the readings for detecting leaks. And uh, so, we're suggesting that there's a much simpler way to uh, uh, deal with this issue than the complex issue of uh, switching out water meters. Now, relating to the, uh, uh, the deputation that I presented for this particular meeting, uh, surely there is a project description business case document for this project, and we would like to see it. And, and I don't think we're being unreasonable in, in requesting that. I'm particularly interested in what data was collected to prove the meters were losing accuracy, which by the way, we are not contesting. We're not contesting that there's an error, but we'd like to know what that error is and how it was arrived at. We'd like to know the calculation for the lost revenue to the town, and we'd like to know how the project is being financed. We have received no response from the town with respect to our objections based on the uh, leakage issue and the accuracy issue, which we presented in our March 5th deputation to the town. We are quite happy to pay a rate premium or a surcharge to compensate the town for lost revenues commensurate with the degree of error in the old meters. Uh, I won't go into uh, Mr. Beaumont's letter of May 5th, um, other than to say that um, it wasn't us that dropped the ball. We responded to Mr. Beaumont's letter and heard nothing back from the town subsequent to that. We estimate this project will cost hundreds of dollars in labor and materials per installation and over $100,000 to do the entire town. We have been advised that this project is at no cost to us. We would be very interested in, know in knowing how it is being financed. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the McIntyre? <clears throat> no. Okay. Uh, I believe there was an email sent to you today from Mr. Kern. I was told. Okay. I haven't seen it. Okay. All right. Um, there's no question, so I want to thank you very well, much for your deputation and the material that you provided. Thank you. I would like to add, uh, under duress of having our water turned off, we have made an appointment for a meter exchange, which we don't want, by the way. We would very much appreciate a response from the town before April 24th, when the meter is scheduled to be replaced. Okay. All right. Thank you. For all that. Mr. Harris is taking those notes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Um, we're switching up the deputations, so we're going to go with um, Mr. Buck, same Georgia Bay opposition to the OPS first. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob Ransky. Oh, okay. Not Tom Bug. Okay, all right. No, I'm just doing it in first basis tonight. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're good at it. Absolutely. I don't know. First yeah. time. First time.
remember. Well, I, I don't know Tom Buck, so I mean, <laughs> no, it's true. unfortunately, Tom's not, not well and couldn't make it, so I'm just uh, um, a substandard substitute. We'll call it <laughs> whatever was failed. Please turn the microphone on. Yes, thank you. We're just going to uh, get the slide incorrect here. Thank you, Worship and Councillors, for the opportunity to present you this evening. My name is Bob Baranski. My family has been a resident of Georgian Bay for 40 years. The people of Save the Bay Association have studied the project for five years. We have collected over 40,000 online signatures opposing the project, 3,300 plus on paper in Southern Georgian Bay. We have filed for and received over 2,000 pages from FOI and ATI requests regarding the project from the Department of National Defense, IESO, and Meepers Council. We have educated thousands of people through community meetings, our website, communications, and media. We have made dozens of deputations and presentations to political leaders, including the Ontario Minister of Energy. The project is a bad deal for Ontario ratepayers compared to viable alternatives, has a great risk of contaminating Georgian Bay, and does not meet the promised TC claims for carbon reduction. Next slide. Say Georgian Bay agrees with the independent electricity operator that storage is needed. IESO is the official energy expert tasked with managing Ontario's grid. The faster Ontario can bring storage online, the less reliant we will be on gas plants. Storage may help Ontario to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Storage will help balance the demand difference between day and night, which exists now. But what will the EVs coming? Will that difference exist in a decade? Next slide. TC Energy's pump storage proposal won't be online until 2035, as per recent comments. What will the demand profile look like then? According to the IASO, Ontario's daily energy consumption profile is predicted to flatten, gradually lowering the demand imbalance, which will then steadily reduce the need for energy storage over time. So although the need for storage to balance high and low demand is a real issue today, it may not be a permanent issue. The IESO predicts that EV battery charging at night and other off-peak energy use will result in the increase in energy demand at night. IESO is bringing thousands of megawatts of battery storage capacity online before the end of this decade, which may help to solve this problem. Next slide. Save George and Bay commissioned a study of the bass species on the military training base. We learned there are bass at risk, which would be displaced by the construction of the reservoir. EMD documents show that 30 species at risk, including chorus frogs and butternut trees, had habitats on the base. Turbidity and fish entrainment are also a concern. It is possible that some of these environmental risks can be mitigated through a thoroughly risk managed construction process and plant design. And we support SON, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, in their role as stewards of the land and water to lessen the harm. However, these risks can only be reduced, not eliminated. Why take the risk for a project that is not needed, especially when there's viable alternatives? That does not pose these risks. Next slide. There are additional concerns that unfortunately cannot be eliminated or mitigated with even the most thorough risk management and the most thoughtful design. One is that the project's construction and operation threaten irreversible harm to the Niagara Garden, destroying 500 acres of the UN designated World Biosphere Reserve. Next slide. A second risk that cannot be mitigated is the inevitable spread of forever chemicals, for which there is no remedial act or solution in the air, land, and water. Heavy metals, unexploded ordnance, and pollutants on the DND site, and in the sediment in the military restricted waters of Georgian Bay, east of the base, are cause for alarm. Documents from the DND ATI disclose contaminants in the soil which are these forever chemicals and carcinogens like PFAS, organic metallic compounds, lead and arsenic. Disturbing the earth on this seriously contaminated site will cause these to flow into the bay and air over us. Toxins will bleach into streams and aquifers, 
draining into an polluting Georgian Bay. For many of these toxins, there is no remediation solution. And once they are exposed from the soil and flow into the water, they will be there forever. Next slide. This project is especially risky since TC Energy has never built a pump storage plant. If TCE can't build a leak-proof crude oil pipeline after decades of experience, what expectation can we have that they have the ability to build the pump storage plant safely? They respond they will do better on this project. They should prove that by doing better with their oil pipelines first. Next slide. What is the alternative? Batteries. Batteries are a more agile and efficient solution. Speed to implementation is a lot faster for batteries and for pump storage. Batteries can be added precisely when and where storage is needed, lessening the need for new transmission lines. Batteries will cause minimal environmental harm for Ontario. Batteries cost are trending down, hydro costs are trending up. Batteries are 90% efficient versus pump storage at 70% efficient. This is a huge difference over 10, 20, or 50 years. Batteries are a better solution for Ontario ratepayers and for Georgian Bay. TC may say batteries will only work for four hours, yet IESO is contracting for multiples. If one runs low on electricity, turn it off and turn another one on, just as we would replace a battery in one of our tools. Battery storage is an agile, flexible solution that can be placed on the grid. There is a real possibility the pump storage plant may be obsolete by 2035. Next slide. The price tag on the risky mega project has skyrocketed from 2.2 billion in 2019 to 4.5 billion last year. When we met the Minister of Energy, he told us he did not know what this would ultimately cost. There are many things unknown and unforeseen. If the minister does not know what, one, what it's going to cost, who does really know what it will cost? This is a huge risk to taxpayers. The minister is now advocating for Ontario taxpayers, you and I, to pay TC Energy's pre-development expenses, despite the fact the project was neither solicited nor subject to a public competition. IASO says no to this project, and is contracted for batteries. The battery projects have First Nations partners as well. Slide 10, please. TC Energy claims that pump storage product offers a green solution, but their reference to net zero is misleading. The Navigant report they commissioned and rely on is incomplete. It fails to consider the diversion of energy exports from US jurisdictions, which will burn coal and gas if they don't get Ontario's energy. Our experts find that the pump storage project will increase CO2 emissions when this is considered. Battery storage will add less CO2 into the atmosphere during construction. The construction of the pump storage plant will add about 500 tons of carbon to the atmosphere. Well, the equivalent amount of battery storage construction would be closer to 100 tons. Batteries would have far more efficient carbon reduction during operation. TC has not shared how they will avoid harm to the species at risk or spreading contaminants. Green is not just carbon. Next slide. We are not the only ones concerned. The Georgian Bay Association is concerned about the environmental risks and why the project is still proceeding after being twice rejected by the IESO. The township of Archipelago, the township of Blue Mountain, the township of Georgian Bay, and you, have passed resolutions objecting to the proposal. Other organizations also seek to preserve the escarpment and offer less costly alternatives to the open loop pump storage plan. Next slide. After years of analyzing the project, it has saved Georgian Bay's conclusion that it takes makes little sense to build any very long-term project, especially this one, that poses such major threats to the environment. Batteries are more agile, efficient, green, and cost-effective solution. Here's some math. Add this pristine environment with water that touches everyone around the bay. To the military base is one of the most contaminated sites in Ontario. Then add TCE's poor environmental record and that they have never built a pump storage plant that equals a risk to all of us. Why take the risk? <clears throat> 
Thank you for your resolution. We urge you to stand fast. You have made the right decision. Thank you. Is there any question? Uh, Councilor Valeski and the Councilor. Thank you, uh, a good presentation. I, I just have a couple of questions. How long are these, these batteries you're proposing? How long are they going to last? I'm not an expert, but if you look on Tesla's and that mega battery site, um, with an extended warranty, all companies like to sell those, it's 20 years. And they offer uh, a recycling in the batteries world, they will take it back for recycling. Okay, and, and further than that, I'm just wondering what they're going to do with, is there any uh, environmental problem with getting rid of the old batteries? If they're taking them in, I guess they've, they've figured some way out of it, but there's gonna be a whole bunch of batteries come online. I'm just, I thought that should be brought into the equation, that's all. Yeah, well again, um, I'm not an expert at it, and certainly, you know, I can gather more information, but uh, just looking at, uh, you know, Tesla, who's a big supplier of these particular types of power units, um, they did have right on their website that they uh, they will take the batteries back and will recycle. Uh, thank you, your but again, um, the the work that's gone into this, I would have thought they would have looked up, because they would know what a battery a question what would be on batteries that the, the people that made this presentation would, would look up what would happen to the batteries. Another one, I, I attended a, a, a conference here in our uh, um, the center here next door last year, and Hydro was there for the presentation on. And their comments were that we need to double, double all our the superstructure and power generation that we have now in the next 20 years. There's going to be such a demand on hydro. And if you're saying that you think the demand is strong, uh, but they're, they're saying that we, we have to double. Everything that's taken 100 years to get where we are now has to be doubled within the next 25 years. Well, the charts that I showed you, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure which slide that was, that's from the Independent Electricity Sister Office, and that's their forecast going, going forward. Right at this point in time, so they they forecast that the difference differential um, between day and evening, which is what requires like there's two different things here. Two, one is storage and one is generation. Um, GCE's project is not a generator; it's a consumer of electricity. So I believe it's slide number. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, group number three, I believe. Um, that's from the ISO showing there's a flattening for, for a need for store, for potential storage. In other words, the evenings and, and the days would be the same. Now, as far as the actual, your question about we're going to need more generation, um, that is, I'm certain, true. Um, but these projects that we're speaking about are not generators. <clears throat> okay, I'm fine, thank you. Um, Rupert Ken Kindersley is online, and I think he has an answer or... Something with the yes, yeah. part, of your, part of your team, right? Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out that the ISO has let con uh, is expecting to have three thousand megawatts of battery storage projects online by twenty twenty eight, and I think we have to trust in ISO. They are the experts that these um, issues around um, recycling batteries and what happens to them when after 20 years have, have all been worked out and they are they are definitely uh, moving ahead strongly with battery storage, um, which can be put in place quickly to solve our current needs. Okay. Just also keep in mind that the suction of the water from Georgian Bay will cause us the microphone will be stuck. Oh, sorry, thank you. Keep in mind that the suction of Jordan Bay bringing up the water up to the Negro Escarpment on the 1942 military base of over eight decades cost you energy to draw that water up over 150 meters. That then goes into a reservoir of over 375 acres that has to still be constructed excavating and carving into your Negra escarpment. 
Councilor Keith. Thank you, but Councilor Belinsky had all my questions. Thank you. Councilor Belinsky, your microphone. Councilor Ashford. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you guys. It was uh, it's great to hear more um, about this as we've kind of gone forward. And I did one question that a lot of this is not something that I deal with regularly, um, aside from it is kind of exciting that when you think of renewable energies and, and these type of projects. But um, one thing that you kind of hear about regularly at Council is um, uh, arguments that are kind of motivated from not in my backyard type situations. Um, so in, with that uh, is, and like we got Tesla batteries on, on site on some of our properties that are, you know, holding resource, holding energy for us. And so I don't wanna, I'm not disagreeing with anything you said, but can you speak further to that issue that I think sometimes it's easy for people to dismiss your position by just saying, ah, oh, they just don't want it at their house. Maybe they wouldn't even care if it was something in Paris. Does our location make us concerned? Absolutely. Um, but I also believe that in the five years we have looked at this, we look at it with a broader term. Um, there is a thousand people directly below this reservoir um, that are afraid, afraid for their, their safety, afraid for their life, because there's going to be a dam constructed over their heads. Of course, the engineers from GC Energy will tell you that their dams will never fail. Um, so there's for sure no concern there. But this deal that we're talking about here is, is, is bad for Ontario. All of us are ratepayers here. And the cost of this particular thing is unknown at this point in time. And uh, TC Energy is seeking a 50-year contract. Um, if you think 50 years back and think of 50 years ahead, the advances in storage that will be placed by then, um, I don't think any of us can imagine you know, them all. And they'll say it's state-of-the-art, but it's, it's 100 years old. They might change the intake and the outtake. They might move some things around, but it's old technology. Um, and the ISO is the experts on this. For many, you know, are, are contracting today. They're contracting today and they're letting contracts go. Many of them with, uh, you know, with Indigenous 50% uh, ownership plus. So they're included in this process. So for sure, I live close to the, this thing. I am concerned, but I don't believe it's just a NIMBY thing. I honestly don't. I believe it's bad for charity. And you can put these batteries right beside where they're needed. And if IESO is right and the curve flattens in the future, you can take them out. You can't take out a 400 acre hole, 60 meters or 20 meters deep in the escarpment. You can't do anything with that. That's permanent forever. So I believe batteries are far more agile, better solution can be moved. If demand drops, you move them out. Certainly when they wear out, you swap them out and put new ones in, recycle the old ones. We use it all the time. Every car we drive, everything we use, right? Hope that answers your question. Man, it's going to say something. Yeah. To speak to you, a wonderful question, and Indianism has definitely been brought up. This is my hometown. I was born and raised in the municipality of Meekert. I've mentioned to the folks in the audience that my toes that touch Jordan Bay, it's the same bay that your toes touch. The body, the nutrients that we drink from, it's the same body of water that you folks drink from. And many of your 30,000 islands depend on that same water. This is not just about Georgian Bay, this is Lake Huron. This is an integral part of our Great Lakes. You don't mess with that. To speak about the national defense, I am an employee of over 14 years with DMD. I was the health and safety representative of DMD. I am very well aware of the 20, over 20 registered endangered species on that base. And the fact that this is an active base since 1942, a tank range, it's named the Meeker Tank Range. On top of that, it is the one base out of Canada that trains all of your infantier soldiers, as well as all of your Ontario Provincial Police. 
The amount of ammunition that that over 9,000 acre military base has seen is drastic. And to have a potential excavation of a backhoe, front hoe, hit a UXO, that's just the start of hazards that this will cause. We are not equipped within health and safety, even on a multi-marginal government basis, municipal, provincial, federal, to deal with the implications of this health hazard that this company will cause. <laughs> Council Camp. Uh, thank you. Again, also, I would add my thanks for your presentation. Certainly, I think we all agree that this is something we don't want. And I don't look at this as a, not my backyard thing because, as you mentioned, the damage is extensive and the potential. Uh, it's fairly, it's fairly, uh, it's beyond what we can imagine. Um, so, a couple of questions. First of all, is this project that can go somewhere where it's not so uh, dangerous to the environment. I really don't understand that much about what the project is is all about. I wouldn't pretend to at this point, but um, it, uh, is there somewhere else where this could go that wouldn't be so jeopardizing to the environment? There are other pump storage projects in consideration by the uh, IESO. They are closed loop systems. So it's this one's open loop. So that means that all the water is taken out of Georgian Bay every day, sucked up the hill when uh, hydro is cheap, and flushed back down when hydro is expensive. Uses 30% more energy, pull it up the hill, then push it down. As you know, when you push something up a hill, it's a lot harder pushing it down. Um, and then it's whatever's in the water goes to these giant turbines, which are really just food processors. And then get spit out afterwards. The closed loop system, which is being considered as well, usually they will take an old mine where there's a large deep pit. That water will be um, pumped up to the station, pumped back to the to the you know to the reservoir. It never they don't draw off of the lake, so that water is continually recycled. I, um, I don't know if there's another place. You know, I, I I'm unaware of that. I don't know if Rupert has. Uh, any idea on that, Rupert? Uh, would you like to chime in and call on that? Uh, yes. Well, the the closed loop system you're talking about is at Marmara. That's also currently under consideration by IESO. And uh, in fact, I asked the same question. Um, Bob of TCD back in 2019, I said, uh, could you could you could you consider please looking at closed loop locations elsewhere in Ontario? Um, all you need is uh, an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir, as you're saying, Bob. Usually, um, quarries uh, are used. Um, there are a number of locations where small pumped, uh, closed loop pump storage uh, projects could be put in place. But frankly, um, the ISO has uh, largely determined that um, battery storage is what they want. Um, in the short term, it can deal with our current. Uh, storage needs uh, because they can be put in place so quickly. Um, I'm not sure that they necessarily are actively looking for more uh, pumped storage projects. Um, the TACE project is unsolicited. It has not been subject to any public tender, which we believe it should be. Um, that way you can guarantee or you can get a better assurance that we're getting value for money. Um, so it's a complicated question in terms of how we deal with our storage needs going forward. But the one thing that is uh, fairly certain is that more people are going to be using electric vehicles and other things that need to be uh, charged up at night. And this demand price uh, situation that we have at the moment with a much lower off-peak energy price than during the day, uh, the peak prices, that's not going to be there for very long. And uh, the as has been said, that that curve is going to flatten. Um, once it gets to a certain point, there is going to be very little need for um, for storage, and certainly not a lot of need for uh, a a hundred year, eighty year, hundred year project like this one, uh, which has no flexibility. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, let's trust the experts. Let's trust IESO, and ask that this project doesn't proceed. Okay, so um, 
So basically, I think there are some people that will, will tell you that uh, that batteries aren't all that green either in the production uh, construction. Batteries takes a lot of uh, toll on the environment in terms of what it, uh, it takes to uh, make them and at some point get rid of them. Uh, I'm just throwing that out there. But uh, so finally, so as you move forward, and it sounds like you're getting a lot of people on your side. Where we, where do you go from there? Do you go back to the province? Do you go back to the corporate rooms? What, what? Uh, because ultimately, I can see there's two fights here: one to get the political will, and one to get the, the shareholders, who obviously, be, you know, they always say follow the money. You know, and, and so, what is, uh, what is there that uh, you can fight? Well, look again. The ISO has looked at this pump storage project not once. Um, but twice. The first time they rejected it, um, when they applied originally, it was rejected by the ISO because it has no value for the red rapers of Ontario. Um, that decision was given to the Minister of Energy of Ontario, Todd Smith. He said, thanks for your effort. I want you to go back and look at it again. They looked at it again, and it's an extensive look, you know, almost a year's time between they came back and they said, this project has no value for the people of Ontario and rejected it again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's why it's still moving ahead when the um, expert organizations tasked by the provincial government, the ISO, twice said it shouldn't go ahead. We don't know that. Um, so it would be a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm just giving a personal opinion. I'm not representing Save Georgia Bay here. But it looks like there's some other reason that we are unaware of at this point in time. So all we can do is keep making people aware that it exists and making them aware there's an alternative. If there's alternatives to this. Those alternatives exist today. The ISO is, is contracting them. Benefits are there for the great pairs of Ontario and for the Indigenous communities, um, which are included in these. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Good luck as you continue with this. Councilor Barman. I, I could just add one quick comment on batteries uh, and uh, what you mentioned about them not being environmentally um, wonderful either. They're not. Um, the, lith the lithium production uh, is a big problem globally I, and, and does create environmental issues in the producing countries. However, the battery technology is um, advancing rapidly from year to year. Uh, there may be no need for lithium in a few years' time. Uh, we, we don't know that. Um, but uh, we do know that uh, this technology is advancing. It's moving forward. Uh, efforts are being made continually to try and make them more environmentally uh, sensitive uh, solution for, for our energy needs. Whereas the technology that... Uh, TCE is applying, other than some of the gadgets that they've got to reduce um, the environmental impact, which is which is good that they've done that. Um, it's uh, it's fifty year old technology, uh, and and the basic theory of pumping water uphill and letting it run down through turbines to create power at peak times is a very basic old school uh, technology. Uh, that basis will never change. Um, in, in fact, uh, in terms of efficiency, that's more like 67% efficient with batteries at 87%. That means that TC Energy will be using 50% more power than they produce. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, you got that one wrong, Bob. It's not 30%. It's 50. It's almost 50%. Uh, it's a massive amount of electricity that they will be losing. All storage projects lose electricity. None of them create electricity. So we, you need to understand that, but you, you want to minimize the amount of electricity that you're losing, okay? Um, and uh, this is an extremely wasteful, inefficient project. So that's another reason why batteries, uh, in my opinion, offer a much better alternative. We can't afford to waste electricity in this profligate uh, fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Did I understand you to say that only four municipalities have passed resolutions with respect to this issue? Three of them in our area. 
I believe you are correct, yeah. So I, my question is, are they asleep in the switch in your neck of the woods or or what's going on there? <laughs> no, like, I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, we are, are just embarking to make people aware around the bay. Um, I would have thought that in you know, being a plague on the whole field that uh, you not have to do very much uh, yeah. informing that the information would be readily available. Yeah. No, it is readily available, but also it's it's uh, not as known as you would uh, as you would imagine. So we are going to do depositions like this to every community we can uh, are allowed to do so around the bay to increase awareness because the awareness has not been there. It's been kept kind of as a local issue and uh, the local issue at this point in time needs to be spread out. Well, that, I guess that's what I was suggesting, <laughs> that it would be a local issue before it got as far afield as Perry Sound. Yeah. So, Councillor, just uh, to speak on that, our neighbours, the town of Blue Mountains, is also in uh, collaboration with you folks. They are our closest neighbours. They are what our children all attend the same school, whether you are town of Blue Mountains, Great Highlands, or Mayford. These are our neighbors that are concerned. Just recently, again, we spoke at the town of Blue Mountains that had again forceful questions to TCE who could not answer their questions. A very similar question that you proposed, Councillor. So definitely we are in uh, mobility to reach our neighboring townships. But regardless of where you are, everyone around the bay is impacted and everyone around the bay needs to have a say. Well, I guess that's my point, that, uh, that the folks who were most impacted seem to be sitting on the fence for whatever reasons. Um, and that, that, you know, that's, that's uh, concerning to me. And secondly, the, the other gentleman had indicated a couple of times that IESO has, uh, you know, made their recommendation once. Have they made their recommendation the second time through to the minister? Yes, they did. Okay, thank you. I suspect then that uh, we, we sent them, he sent them back to the drawing board for a third time. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Any further questions? No. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, yes. Well, thank you for the interesting questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. Take care, Rupert. Good to see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, um, our next deputation is from TC Energy, um, the Ontario Product Storage OPS. Can you have a presentation I have to take with it as well? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Worship, uh, members of council. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for this opportunity to address your council this evening. I'm John Nicholson. Um, I'm director at TC Energy, and uh, I've been leading the development of this Ontario Pump Storage Project now for about six years. <clears throat> I'm joined uh, tonight uh, by my colleague, Sarah Beasley. Uh, online, I uh, believe we have uh, uh, Greg Simon. Sarah leads our community uh, relations, and Greg is a uh, former member of the Canadian Army and um, our local DME site coordination uh, representative. He can answer any questions you might have about uh, the base itself. Uh, while we work for TC Energy, we're speaking tonight on behalf of the project, uh, which, if it proceeds, would be a partnership with Saudi and Jibwa Nation. Representatives of the Saudi and Jibwa Nation are not uh, present this evening. But I would encourage you to reach out to them uh, to get their perspective on this very interesting project. 
To begin, I want to share a little background. I'm an engineer. I'm a graduate of the University of Waterloo, and I've been developing and constructing power projects in Ontario for over 35 years. This project, the Ontario Pump Storage Project, is without a doubt the most important and compelling project I've ever had the opportunity and privilege to work on. First and foremost, it represents a significant climate change initiative, an important component in achieving a net zero electricity system for Ontario. It's a meaningful and important step in our journey towards Indigenous reconciliation, which I'll speak to in a moment. And lastly, it's an opportunity to develop a local energy solution that creates jobs and economic stimulation here in Ontario. Important for you tonight is the fact that prior to the start of any construction activities or operations, we will need to successfully complete rigorous and comprehensive environmental assessment processes to fully understand and address any potential impacts. These assessments are yet to begin and are anticipated to take three years. My commitment and my conviction to see this project succeed deepens with every passing day, but I'm not alone in, this, in the way I feel about this project. I know that this passion is shared by my whole team at Deep Energy, including my colleagues here tonight. All of us were here in Perry Sound a week ago uh, at the township of the Archipelago Council meeting where Chief Greg Najwan and Councillor Paul Jones of the Chippewas of Neewatch conceded First Nations spoke about what this project represents for Saigon and Chippewa Nation and why they are interested in advancing this initiative. Chief Najwan finished by asking the township of the Archipelago to work together with him, and I expected if he were here tonight, he would ask the same of you. I hope that after this evening, the town of Perry Sound will join us in working together on this important journey. We've taken a very different approach to the development of this project, and I thought it might be worthwhile to describe for a moment that process. Firstly, from the beginning, we have sought to develop a project that is grounded in a fundamental need, a fundamental societal need, and the rationale for this project continues to get stronger and stronger every year. Last year, Ontario grew by 450,000 people, and that number is expected to continue to grow. That's like adding the population of the City of London every year to the province of Ontario. At the same time Ontario is growing, it's electrifying. We're buying electric vehicles, installing heat pumps, electrifying transit, making clean steel, and new investments by companies like Stellantis, Volkswagen, and Honda are all adding to the provincial demand. The government of Canada is prioritizing efforts to combat climate change with the goal of achieving a net zero electricity grid by 2050. That will require Ontario to eventually close its gas fire generation and replace it with new clean electricity. Combined, these forces will drive a need for Ontario to double its supply of clean electricity by 2050. We cannot and will not get to a net zero grid without massive amounts of energy storage. Under any future scenario for Ontario, whether it goes the renewable route or the nuclear route, or likely a combination of both, Ontario will need energy storage to be able to balance and operate its clean electricity system, the system that we and every one of us in this, in this room rely on day in and day out. From the environmental perspective, pumped hydro storage is hands down the most proven and environmentally responsible energy storage solution to meeting these emerging and enduring needs. At its heart, this project is a climate change initiative, a clean energy initiative that will assist with the orderly transition away from Ontario's reliance on fossil fuel generation. We're already witnessing the impacts of climate change, the implications of which are particularly amplified for those that live around Georgian Bay. This winter marks the lowest ice covered in Georgian Bay in recorded history, and climate change is arguably the biggest single threat to Georgian Bay. Fluctuating water levels, severe and more frequent storms, flooding, wastewater, stormwater overflows, and changes to habitat. These are all products of a changing environment. While this project on its own will not reverse the damage of climate change, it is a constructive and concrete step toward a better future. Not only is this a climate change initiative, it represents one of the largest indigenous reconciliation initiatives currently underway in Canada. If this project moves forward, it will be through a partnership with Saudi Energy Foundation. We have made a commitment that we will not proceed without their support and their participation. 
So I need the Jibbo Nation will have significant equity ownership and active roles in the management and environmental stewardship of the project. And we made a commitment to ensuring that they have opportunity for employment, training, contracting, and supply to the project. Through their ownership in the project, a stable, long-term source of income will be created for the nations that would have significant impacts in improving services, infrastructure, and the quality of life within their communities. This project would be a source of pride and is a key to their economic self-determination. Last week, Chief Ritchie and Chief Najwan released a video that describes this journey and their perspective on this project. If you haven't already seen it, I would encourage you to view this video to enhance your understanding of their perspective and what this project means to them. I would be happy to send you the link if you, uh, if you, have, if you can't find it. <laughs> Saudi and the Jibwe Nation has a very special relationship with Jordan Bay. They have a responsibility as caretakers of the land and waters within their territory to protect it, as they have been doing for hundreds of years. For Saudi and the Jibwe Nation, the waters of Jordan Bay, uh, Jordan Bay bring and sustain life. Their relationship with the Bay is sacred, and they have a duty uh, to care and protect the water. Let us be clear, the Saudi and Ojibwe Nation will not allow this project to move forward if we cannot demonstrate that we are protecting Georgian Bay. And that's why they've had a leading role in the design of this project. That's why for the past several years, they've been conducting their own independent environmental assessment review, which includes discussions with the Saudi and the Maywatch fisheries, fishers, whose livelihood depends on the bay. They know the bay better than anyone else, and they've been making decisions about this project based on facts. Yes, uh, so you know I've heard some arguments here this evening regarding batteries. Let's stop, maybe I'll take a moment just to, to speak to those. There's no question that batteries will have an important role in the Ontario's electricity system. We need diversity in technology and in capabilities in the energy systems that and batteries can provide a very important function. This includes battery treatment that is already operating here in Perry Sound. The roles of batteries in the project that we're proposing are very different. It's not a case that either pump storage and or batteries, but rather pump storage and batteries. Batteries are more suitable for shorter durations, operating for a maximum of four hours, versus our project, which would operate for approximately 10 hours, 10 plus hours, supporting the integration of additional nuclear and renewable capacity. In fact, the curves that you saw earlier this evening actually support what we're saying here, that the curves are flattening, then that they would indicate that the need is for longer and longer duration storage. Lifespan for batteries is short, 15 to 20 years, versus our project, our, our proposal, which is an operating life of about 80 years. And there are other challenges with batteries. Uh, a global supply chain that is dominated today by China. Pressure, pressure that the siting of battery uh, facilities will place on prime agricultural lands that we need for a precious uh, farmland. And also from a perspective of domestic content, uh, batteries are uh, batteries and pump storage are sort of diametrically opposite. While we expect to have about 80% of domestic content for our project, batteries would have somewhere near 20% domestic content. When it comes to long duration energy storage at scale, pump type of storage is the optimal solution for Ontario. The cost and the environmental footprint to replicate our project using batteries would be significantly higher than the overall life cycle impact is considered, including mining, manufacturing, transportation, installation, replacement, and disposal. The importance of this project to Ontario's future was validated in January with, through the Ministry, uh, through a letter from the Ministry of Energy to the ISO. The process that's outlined in that letter is prudent and appropriate to ensure the project provides an overall economic benefit for Ontario and to make sure all of the information is available and to inform a final decision on advancing this project. We're continuing to work with the Ministry of Energy and the Ontario Energy Board to establish a long-term commercial framework, and we expect that this project will be regulated, re-regulated, which ensures that the project provides Ontario residents and businesses both cost prudency, transparency, flexibility, fairness, and the lowest possible cost. I would also like to underscore this project remains in a, in a conceptual stage. We have a full regulatory assessment process ahead of us, both federal, provincial impact assessments are required, and I've already mentioned the, the oversight by the Saigon Nation. 
This will be a three plus year process, and we anticipate starting that this process later this year. Recognizing that the development of energy projects can be challenging, change can be hard, but we have a responsibility to think about the big picture, the long term, and make meaningful steps now for a better future. Our proposed project represents an opportunity and a solution to actually address the growing threats of climate change. It represents a meaningful and real Indigenous reconciliation initiative. We shared a short deck uh, with, uh, with, uh, with you, and I had only a few minutes here to describe this extraordinary opportunity tonight. If you have any further questions or feedback to share, I would really be happy to meet with you again and, and discuss with your staff. We welcome the opportunity to share a collaborative dialogue about the project facts. Um, there was a mention also about some of the local municipalities. We have resolutions of conditional support from Meaford, the whole community, and also the neighboring community, the, the uh, city of Owen Sound, your neighbors across the bay. I would encourage you to reach out to Meaford, Owen Sound representatives, and ask questions and share in their learnings about this project. I would also encourage you to read uh, Our Ontario's Growth. That's a document that was released by the Ontario Ministry of Energy that talks about the province's plan for a clean energy future. And earlier this month, the independent electricity system operator, the ISO released their 2024 annual planning outlook, and it's a forecast of electricity demand and supply for the next 25 years. The report highlights the need for additional supply that I've spoken to this evening, a forecast a gap more than eight times the output of the Ontario pump um, storage project by 2035. I encourage you to read this document to further understand the rationale behind this project. Thank you for your time. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share this information with you this evening. I hope it's been helpful, and I would hope that you will uh, join us and work together as Chief Nadjmo spoke to us last week uh, to advance this important initiative. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Council McCann? Okay, first of all, thank you for your, uh, your deputation this evening. Uh, how would you answer them? We've heard earlier tonight that the IESO twice has said this is not a good location. How do you speak to that? Sorry, a good location? I think it speaks to the location. Sorry. When you talked a lot about, you know, uh, in terms of, of ind uh, Indigenous uh, involvement, and, and it's a good idea, but from a practical point of view, can you, can you describe uh, in your own words, how the city, huh? because I really don't understand what's going on here. You know, you know uh, what are you trying to do? And uh, the IDSO was twice said allegedly that this is not a good location for this project. Yeah, sorry, they didn't speak to the location. Uh, their, their assessment was really strictly from the perspective of the energy or electricity system of Ontario, not from the not from the respect to location. Um, I, I, can, I can certainly speak to the location. We think this is the best location in Ontario for pump type story. It has all of the right ingredients. You know, if we have uh, an elevation that's appropriate for the technology or close to Jordan Bay, very short distance between uh, the source of water and the reservoir that we plan to construct, some very short conveyances, which are, you know, and, and, and uh, provide a very cost effective uh, solution. And I think the fact that we're behind the, the, uh, the behind the fence of a military base is a, is, a, is an added plus. You know, we have um, we're not using public land for uh, or taking away any public land for like that could be used for other purposes. Uh, and we are committed to working with the Department of National Defense to ensure that they can continue to do their important task of training troops. Okay, thank you, Councilman Bolowski. Thank you for your worship. Uh, very good presentation. I just um, the, the presentation before you claimed that, that you're going to do 66% more power than you're going to achieve. Uh, did I hear that wrong? It's... Yeah, so the, it, uh, there's a lot of focus on efficiency here, but in, in, in actual fact, I don't think there's a, it, it, it won't, you know, st all storage, uh, all storage technologies have uh, efficiency associated with their with their round trip efficiency, and I think we're we're competitive with virtually any like pump storage is competitive with any other storage technology when it comes to that aspect. Um, but I think what you have we have to understand is what we're what we're attempting to do here. What we're doing is we're you know we're utilizing uh, clean energy, nuclear or renewable energy at times when it has no no purpose. You know when it's either wasted or not being utilized. Uh, we're storing that uh, electricity and we're returning it back to the system at a time when it's needed. So, you know, we're turning something that currently today is a waste 
into something that will be a useful product for us, particularly at, at peak demand times. Is that your uh, this time, I guess I'm getting confused here. From what I can understand, it's going to cost more to operate this than what it's making. Uh, well, well, effectively, what we're doing is utilizing a waste product and putting it back onto the system to be to be evaluated. Yeah. It's just moving to time shifting. We're time shifting. Uh, you know, when wind is generating at night and we can't use it, we're storing that uh, wind energy. We we'll use it the next day uh, at, to meet our peak needs. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I, I just, I'm just so just not getting it yet. <laughs> we'll try and make it. I guess several for me. Um, you're taking power during the day and pumping it up there. That's power that could be used for your oh, I'm sorry, you're taking power at night. That's right. And, and pumping it up there. But we're still in the position where, where we need all the hydroelectricity we can get, regardless whether it's daytime, nighttime. Right now, it's just the cost is different. That may equal out someday, they might not have a difference. But... <sighs> It's still going to, if you were to take dollar for dollar, it's going to cost more to operate this unit than what it's going to make. Yeah, so I think um, a, lot of, a lot of questions I've had there, but uh, firstly, from the perspective of value, uh, if you have wind a turbine at night that's not being used, you know, the value of that, power, of that power is zero. If you can store that electricity and use it the next day, that's a net gain. That's a net benefit to the electricity system, and that, that how the economics around uh, the value of this equation work. What we're proposing is a what we call rate regulated rate regulation. So as a commercial structure rate regulation. So it's a cost of service arrangement where the facility is paid to be available to operate uh, on demand, uh, and it moves power from times of uh, excess to times of need um, to the benefit of the rate payer. So it's going to be designed so that it runs to, to maximize the benefit to the rate payer. That's that's the premise for the project. I guess the solar panels aren't doing too much at that time of night either, are they? <laughs> solar panels. But, but you're quite right. As we add more and more solar, there's a perspective, uh, there is a potential that during the day when you have access solar, you could store that excess solar and use it during the peak periods during the day. So that it has a lot of flexibility. That's the, the, the primary purpose is moving energy, moving from times of access to times of need, but it also has a very important function for the operability of the system. So as you have, uh, you know, uh, more and more renewable added to electrical system, the you know the uh, dependability of that system becomes less and less because you can't depend on wind, you can't depend on solar to be there exactly when you need it. So that's the other function that this facility would, would provide. It's very very fast response, so it can deal with very very quick and very very uh, abrupt changes in supply and demand, storing when there's excess and and, and providing when it's needed. Great. Um, that really wasn't a question. You're right. Yeah. Okay. But thank you very, very much. Okay. Councilor Barman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a couple of quick questions. How much of a rate differential was required to make this viable? How much actual power are you anticipating that you're going to generate? And, and what percentage of that or what percentage is that of the need uh, are we drop, talking drops in the bucket or how big an impact can a project like this have yeah um again i i could ask you to sort of review the materials that are that have been produced by the ISO so you get a real sense of size but this is what we're proposing is about a thousand megawatts um and we have a storage capacity of about 11 hours so we would be able to, to generate enough you know electricity that's roughly the, the load for about a million ontario homes so effectively we could supply this for 11 hours we could provide a supply for 11 hours so and and with respect to you know when you're pumping, you're, it's the exact same um, pumping uh, capacity. It's a thousand megawatts. You just take longer to pump than it takes to to um, to generate. So that's a, it's important. But I mean, in terms of this, this it so it provides energy. It also provides capacity. So it Correct. stores energy and provides capacity. From the perspective of capacity. Um, you know, and I just mentioned that it represents about an eighth of what's going to be required by 2035. We're planning to come on stream in, in late 2032. 
Um, but this facility, um, you know, in 2035, the forecast that you'll see in the, the most recent IC report indicates that they need about 8,000 megawatts. So this would be about one eighth of what's needed. Okay, so it's a big. It's it meaningful. It, it will have a meaningful impact on the electricity system on Ontario. Thank you. Councilor Camp, Jason. Thank you. A couple more questions. Um, are you using windmill power uh, or wind turbine? Wind turbines, I'm sorry, is it in addition to uh, solar panels? What, or is it strictly solar? Yes, yeah, so it's this is a what we call a grid asset. So it's not connected or coupled with any particular uh, generator or or technology. It would be it would simply absorb uh, electricity from the Ontario electricity grid during times of access. So it could be generated by wind. It could be nuclear. It could be nuclear at night. Nuclear facilities like to run base load. They don't like to turn down. So rather than turning down a nuclear plant at night, you run a coal out, and then you store that capacity or that energy in this resource at night. Could come from solar. And you know, there are periods of solar uh, generation on weekends or during the day, which is uh, you know very uh, which exceeds the the provincial demand. They can store some of that. I don't understand. Uh, or component is imports. You can import clean electricity. The other question is, and your predecessor mentioned tonight that this was that you're involved through no tendering process. Uh, is, is TC a, a private company, and, and how did you become involved with the province over this? Yeah, so um, we are a private company, uh, and the process is actually outlined in the letter of January 9th. If you want, I'm happy to circulate that that letter. But the Minister of Energy has effectively defined a process uh, for to, for the, the commercialization and the uh, cost recovery uh, for this project over the next uh, two weeks, two and a half years. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ashford. Uh, thank you. I have to say, when I, when I was learning about this, I was very excited about this project. Um, I think uh, we call it hydro in Ontario because we have this amazing track record with, with using water to create energy. And um, and I, I think I read on your website at one point, something like 43% of what Niagara Falls does is, is going to be able to come out of this uh, particular project. So when I'm, when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking like, this is big, this is exciting, this is exactly what we need. Um, so I think those things are are true in, in isolation. My concern is, I think one is, please circulate that letter, because I think the when it comes to the financial cost of this, I'm also scratching my head saying like, why are you not getting the green light from, from regulators? You know, and why is this not a great, you know, why isn't everyone just jumping up in the air for this? Why is it why is it being contested in, in, in different ways by kind of third parties in, almost in it? Um, and then the second part with that is uh, um, I feel like our our hydroelectric dams, although they've been this amazing thing for us, have also done a lot of damage. And I start thinking like imagine a world where a Niagara Falls dam didn't get put in. Imagine the damage that did. And um, you know we're in a community right now where our dam failed once and uh, a lot of people died and a lot, there's a lot of environmental disaster from it. Um, and we're kind of in, you know, uh, like I'm a, from Essex County and like, you know, we got the windmills, but we got a lot of birds getting chopped up too, you know, and, and you're kind of, you're kind of in this, like where the architects of the demise of our own planet and how do we architect our way out of that? And, and is, is this project, is this project just going to turn again to be something that at some point we say we wish we we wish we hadn't done such a big project or such a dramatic project? It's exciting to me, and I'm like, wow. But then I'm also reminding myself, you know, a lot of these other projects were probably pretty exciting to people. And am I getting carried away with myself in that excitement? Um, and is this maybe even something that's is there alternatives to this in in, a, in concept? That TC would even be able to do, like in scalability or, or different things. Like, could there be three smaller projects? We start one now, we see how it goes. Like, are, what can, is there any consideration to what can be done to make this project consider more than just, you know, we're building a large, exciting thing that is going to help in some way? I guess, how do we put this, how do we put this in the context of our current situation? Is there anything that you guys can do? Because I, I almost feel like there's no, answer to the questions that are being brought up, I guess.
yes, I did in some way. Yeah, uh, a lot to unpack there. Maybe just start with uh, your your comment around uh, uh, the, the, I think the ministers, the process that the ministers are undertaking. Uh, so I think you know this is a big decision, a big decision for the government. Uh, you know, as I said, this is an eighty-year asset. They have made a decision on an eighty-year asset, um, and I think that the process that they put together is prudent. You know, they needed a more refined cost estimate before they were prepared to move forward. Uh, they wanted to see more advancement of the development before they were uh, prepared to move, move forward. And I think also very important um, for them was that they needed to have a better understanding of the broader societal and economic benefits that the project would generate. So that is a component of the letter that you'll see is that they're looking for, uh, you know, to, to understand, uh, you know, what this project, what this, because of its scale, uh, because of this investment, that, you know, you know, what it would mean to the broader of Ontario, what it means from a societal what a perspective. So all those things are, you know, things that they they uh, decided they wanted to do, and that's why you see uh, this, this process. Uh, in terms of the, your, I think your concerns around dams and, and reservoir, the reservoir safety, again, like uh, the environmental assessment process that, you know, is a three-year process, we also have to go through a fairly rigorous and uh, regulatory process associated with uh, proving that the reservoir is is uh, is safe, and, I said, and, it, and your concern is me around this. I mean, I just wanted to, to give you a bit of perspective here. Pump storage is being developed around the world right now. Like there, in fact, there is as much pump storage in construction and development right now as there exists in the world today. And pump storage, by the way, represents ninety five percent of all electricity storage in the world. Like ninety five percent. So when we talk about lithium ion batteries and all this, the, these other technologies. You know, they only represent five percent of the existing uh, storage capacity in the, in the world uh, today. So, you know, there's a lot going on in pump storage, not so much in Canada, but there is lots of it going on uh, inter internationally. And I think what also I think you know of importance, you know, from an anecdotal uh, perspective, is that a lot of the pump storage is going on in China, and China has access to you know they they own the lithium ion battery supply chain. So they have access to, to the lithium ion batteries and they're choosing, uh, you know, quite prudently to develop pump type of storage as well. <clears throat> uh, Councilor McDonald. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, I know it's been mentioned before and I just wanted to know if, if there was a possibility to create a closed loop Pump storage as opposed to an open loop pumping out of the bay and back into the bay. Has that been considered? Yeah, I think um, there's sort of two points here. First of all, um, you know, a closed loop is not without its impact. Uh, you know, you're building a second reservoir, and in particularly in the location where it's located, you know, that is on the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, so I think it would be virtually impossible to do that without creating some kind of visual, um, you know, some, some visual impacts uh, to the to the escarpment. Um, you know, we saw from the very beginning to make this project as acceptable as possible. You know, we went through a fairly rigorous redesign of the process back in 2020, 2021. Uh, and if you know some, some of the figures that, that I think have been shared in the deck here, you know, accepting the reservoir, virtually everything is either underground or underwater, so it's out of sight. Uh, so that was, you know, that was a, a decision that we made early on uh, that we, and we recognized that was needed to be able to make this project uh, acceptable to, uh, to, 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 to folks. So we made that uh, decision then. Your question around, you know, closed loop, open loop, um, you know, I think we have, you know, really focused on protecting Georgia Bay. And what we're proposing for this project, and we've been working closely with Saudi and Jibwa Nation on is, you know, these inlets, inlet outlets that are in, uh, that will be in Georgian Bay, that will be the primary interface with Georgian Bay, uh, really focused on that design of those to minimize any potential impact to Georgian Bay, to fish, to fish habitat, to, to water quality. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I just can't help but think if something like that were to be developed here, say on our CAL, CIL property, property that was contaminated, um, I don't think it would sit well, and I still, you know, I still stand by by my resolution yeah, yeah. to put forward um, in opposition because I just honestly I can't see myself um, putting myself behind something like this that would that would damage our bay here and, and upset our habitat and everything else. So, so that's just my opinion. Councilor Keith. 
Yes, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one is, how does this compare to the Churchill generation station, the dam in, in uh, Labrador? I have seen it. So how does it compare? Well, um, from a perspective, this is this is not a hydro project. We're not damming a river to uh, to uh, you know to create a hydro a hydro facility. Um, the, the the you know mechanical components themselves, which will in, in our case be located deep deep under underground, will be very similar. But I think uh, from that perspective, uh, there's about the I think the only real similarity between uh, uh, us and and uh, and. Church Paul, you're going to ask me how big Church Paul's and like, I don't have the answer right now. I have to, I have to look, turn the scale. No, I'm not going to ask you that, but I had a very good, uh, shall we say, tour. Spent quite a bit of time underneath taking a look at that, but I wanted to have an idea underground what, what the impact would be there. The other question is a much simpler question, and uh, I know it's been mentioned tonight more than once, and rightfully so. Climate change has been happening all along. And I look at this year, this year because of that, uh, we have uh, less snow and it seems to me when I go by the dam, the bottom line is that already we have a lower amount of water. So with this plan that's being proposed, how is that going to impact things? Because your studies, it would suggest to me there's going to be a little more water than what we're seeing this year or maybe next year. Can you comment, please? Yeah, I just want to make clear that uh, we're not damming a river here, mm -hmm. so we're not really um, at, uh, like, we, we won't be, um, I would say, at the mercy of, you know, uh, the sort of annual water uh, precipitation. So we're taking water out of Georgia Bay, uh, gently removing it from Georgia Bay, storing it, and then, you know, as as electricity stored energy, and then returning it to Jordan Bay, again, gently returning it to, to Jordan Bay, so that's the whole premise of this project. I understand that, but it seems to me if you were making a cake and you needed a half cup uh, of, of milk, and you only have a quarter of meat, it's going to be an impact. And I, it just seems to me, from what you're explaining, if there's still less water to use, I'm wondering how that impact is. I understand what you're doing, but it seems to me there's still less water to work with. Yeah, uh, okay. So yeah, in terms of it's like perspective, this is a, a, a mining fraction of the water that's in Georgia Bay, if that's what you're referring to. We've gone up quite deep, so we're not, uh, I don't anticipate that any impacts on climate change would impact, impact the ability for us to actually water yeah. Any further questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I just encourage you to reach out to the chief. I'm sure they'd be happy to provide their perspective. Thank you. Too. Thank you. I was just going to ask if we could have those links for the video. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can send them to our clerk. Uh, I'll send them to Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's important. Just going to say, uh, for a couple of years ago, uh, prior to the merger with Lakeland, the board of parents and power actually considered this as an option when the first uh, rate differentials were introduced. That option went away. But those those uh, time of use rates were canceled for a period of time, and uh, as Councillor Gillespie said, it wasn't uh, it wasn't so attractive uh, when uh, black news came back in the game. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's the deputation. Nice. Parents, we say the questions for staff for after deputation, so. Any council got any questions for staff? Councilor, uh, no. thank you, Worship. Um, this might be for uh, Mr. Thompson um, in regards to if there's been any updates as to the um, <clears throat> events that transpired at Tower Hill on Good Friday. <laughs> um, 
through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, there was an event on Tower Hill with uh, uh, some uh, uh, police emergency activity on Friday night with regards to someone on top of the tower. Uh, to resolve the issue, there ended up with the fire department cutting a hole in the roof of the tower to bring the uh, the individual down off the tower. So it was damage to public property. At that time, the um, tower was locked and closed so as not to allow access into it. So currently, that's still the status of the tower. There's no structural damage or anything of that nature. However, it's not safe for people to be heading up to the uh, top floor right now. Um, Monday, I visited it. Mr. Kearns visited it. Uh, Mr. Vandermeer visited it to take a look at, at how we can proceed with um, the repairs that are necessary. Mr. Kearns the lead on that. He's pursuing uh, opportunities to conduct those repairs as quickly as we can so we can have that facility back in use. At the same time, I'm working with the OPP in terms of the um, cause of the incident and what opportunities there are for us to pursue um, compensation or other aspects of uh, dealing with the, the repercussions of the situation. Those conversations are ongoing right now. I actually have an email from the OPP saying in my inbox that I need to respond to yesterday tonight with regards to uh, how those will proceed. Uh, just at this time, I would like to say the four fire departments that were involved, thank you very much, uh, and ours um, as well. Uh, the um, uh, Obviously, the OPP, they're having to be called to the situation. I'm sure there were paramedics on hand as well, uh, and then everyone was involved trying to get that individual down off there and safely so that no one was hurt and no one was. Thank goodness. So thank you. Uh, if you can please extend our thank you to to all those involved in, in that event. Yes. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Due to the nature of the the specialized rescue that, that could have been necessitated, through mutual aid, we run a um, triangle rescue team. And people who are on that team consist of uh, firefighters from Carling Township, Seguin Township, and the town of Perry Sound. So as a team, when we have anything that deals with rope rescues, especially high angle rope rescues, those three departments all attend. In this particular case, there was a request from the OPP to have um, some drone footage that would be um, provided by a emergency agency. There was lots of drone footage available from the public. Uh, maybe I'll speak to that in a couple of seconds. But um, Maduka Township, does run a drone program, and we requested that they their fire department come in. So there was the four fire departments, OPP, were the first agency that were called to the scene and were on scene, as well as the uh, Prairie Sound District EMS. I would also note that um, Prairie Sound Public Works did attend to help us secure the facility afterwards, and uh, were there to assist and help as well. Uh, I guess one concern that I do have is the interaction with the public during the incident. There was um, not, not aggressive confrontations, but more, more confrontational than necessary, requesting the public to be moving away from the scene. And uh, that's unfortunate because you know, it was mostly the firefighters who were trying to do that for everyone's safety sake and uh, the privacy of everyone who was involved. And yet there was still pushback from the public to um, recognize that maybe being at the foot of the tower was not the best place for them or for uh, anyone during these operations. Uh, additionally, there were numerous private drones that were being flown over the scene, which quite frankly was not helpful in the least to the entire situation. Uh, it disappoints me a little bit in the public's need and thirst for information. Uh, immediately and their disregard for maybe the operations that uh, are going on. By no means is this a majority of the public, but there are certainly some individuals who maybe didn't need to be involved, who were involved in the entire, entire operations, and when they were politely asked to maybe not be involved, they didn't take that very kindly. So overall, there was a, a great deal of cooperation and everyone was pursuing the same ends. So it was a successful operation, 
And unfortunately, it had to occur uh, in the first place. But uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get the tower back open and operating for everyone's enjoyment as soon as possible. Thank you. I, you know, the, the big thing here was that no one ended up being hurt, which was good. Um, but, you know, there does need to be a certain amount of respect out there that I believe that the public needs to understand that when a situation like this happens, they need to back off and let the people that are doing the work that needs to be done be able to do it. And if that respect's not there, then, you know, stay away totally. If you think you're going to show some disrespect, just stay away. But, you know, people don't realize when some somebody does something like this, the cost that's there and the lives that are in jeopardy because of an act like this as well. It really can become a very tenuous and severe situation. And I'm just glad that it worked out okay and that everyone was safe. And uh, thank you again for everyone involved in working on this project. Or, trying to make this a better outcome than what it could have been. Thank you. Councillor McCann. So this is a sidebar then to Councillor McDonald's question and again to Chief Thompson. There, I know some very responsible drone operators and they follow the rules. Uh, is there not, particularly around there, because of the aerodrome in that area, is it not illegal to fly a drone in that area? And Overall, generally speaking, do you need to have a uh, proper license to be flying a drone within town? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I am not a uh, drone operator expert by any means. I know that there are concerns over the aerodrome. I don't know the distances from the aerodrome that uh, everyone needs to be maintained. I think uh, the point here more so is just responsible for morals. Of people when they are um, uh, operating drones, or I'm not really referring to any specific rules other than than people being responsible morally. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Any other questions of staff, Councillor um, Pete? Thank you. My question is for Chief Thompson, and I'm hoping you can assist me here. Um, in the last week and and on Saturday, also. Um, so I've had at least three queries uh, shortly because I think that uh, weather is gradually improving and it's going to get nicer. So we're all hopeful and looking forward to summer and fun, fun, fun. And uh, I was um, going through my resolutions and directions in respect to the public washrooms. And the best thing could come up with was on August 3rd, I noticed there was a direction for staff follow-up that a report um, uh, being prepared and shared with council on how the public washrooms could be open for a longer period of time with options and costs and i'm concerned about that also not because it's tourism and it's part of business doing the best we can but i'm also thinking of the operation budget can you clarify what happened there like where we are there please that's true you mr mayor certainly i can and uh, the answer is that we are still working on the development of a plan that's going to be what you know, we think uh, reasonable and acceptable to council. Um, as you're aware, we're also dealing with the Big Sound Marina uh, contract that's coming forward. And this, of course, ties into the operator's contract. And uh, so there, there's a bunch of moving parts. We're attempting to align the Wabanoe Beach hours with the hours and that uh, are going to be occurring at the town dock, and that's just necessitating negotiations and prudent discussions and determination of costs for when those facilities open. Generally, we don't open those facilities until um, middle of May, and um, we're trying to iron out those issues currently to bring them back to. I think that um, Mr. Kern and I are both quite aware of what council's desire is with regards to those hours. It's um, uh, determining how to best facilitate it at the least cost to the repairman. What I'm asking also, and I appreciate your response, is that that includes also 
Uh, so it's consistent, the average of the public washing downtown. So I know there was discussion about the council had mentioned about nine or 10 p.m. at night. My concern is, is that when one is looking at those costs, if there needs to be a, a second contract, whatever, to extend those hours, that that is also considered because I think that this is prime time and doing business well in our community is really important. So I hope that will come into play. And also a figure, even if it's approximate, it will be able to be uh, added to the operation budget so we can discuss it. Thank you. Um, I know you got your hand up again, Council Cam, but <laughs> Council Borman and Councilor Ash should also have too. So I'll start with Councilor Borman. So, so I'm not sure if my question is for Mr. Cairns. I thought I seen Mr. McNamara's name up there. April 20th is Earth Day. Do we have any particular events planned uh, within the community to uh, recognize and celebrate that? Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bourne. I'm in through your worship. Um, there are a lot of Earth Day family fun activities taking place on Saturday, April 20th from 9 a.m. to noon at the Bob York Community Center. Um, we're asking families to register for this event at perrysound.ca on our events calendar. Um, we have many, many partners included in this Family Fun Day, um, partners like Early On, the Public Library, and the Perry Sound Friendship Center. So um, participants are we're planning on learning about planting, growing seeds, uh, Mother Earth teachings, and much more. So again, we encourage everybody to check out the uh, town website. There's a lot going on throughout the month of April that I'd like to highlight, not only Earth Day, um, but we do have Kitchen Week happening the week of April 20th to 27th, um, whereby businesses, organizations, community groups can register on the town website, um, pick an area that they'd like to clean up. Town staff will provide groups with um, the appropriate PPE to collect this garbage. We will also um, uh, or make arrangements to collect whatever whatever cool and neat findings these community groups are, are, are going to pick up for us. I'd also like to draw Council's attention to um, Paint Winter Goodbye. Uh, the Bob York Community Centre is saying goodbye to the ice surface this Sunday. Um, and we're inviting families, um, young families, to come on out and join us from 10 to 2 at the Community Centre um, to, to, uh, to do some artistic artwork on the ice surface before we say goodbye to it. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we would like people to pre-register for that as well. And helmets are mandatory for all participants. If I can take one more second, I do have one more really cool commercial for everybody. Um, the Town of Perry Sound does sponsor the Sport Rec and Leisure Fair annually that's held at the Bob York Community Center. This is an opportunity for all sport recreation groups that um, have lots of cool activities over the course of the summer to come on out and do registration night. So this is taking place at the Bob Muir on Thursday, April 7th, or so, Thursday, April 18th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Again, we have many organizations signed up uh, to join us that night at the community center, allowing parents an opportunity to see what all of the fun happenings are that are going on in, um, in Perry Sound. Thank you. Thank you for the public service announcement. That's good. Uh, Councilor Asher. Uh, this is a question about uh, sort of garbage uh, about town. And um, I, I had the opportunity to uh, be reading the um, uh, dialogue we have around garbage and, and pick up and whatnot in town on the weekend. And uh, uh, was uh, Spending a little bit of time out Sunday morning with uh, with the kids who got their uh, brand new Easter bike and uh, scooter, right? And so we went to a few flat services and noticed that some of the um, uh, places that they wanted to ride their bikes had a bit of an offensive odor. So uh, they didn't seem to care, but I was stuck there. And I, I thought to myself, um, 
is this even something that's regulatable? It didn't seem to be mentioned in the uh, in the garbage bylaws um, for for what's going on, and it, it certainly is subjective in a way. So I was just wondering if uh, we have ever researched that kind of thing, if it if it is a thing, and if there's anything that can be done to try to uh, to help make sure that uh, as as we kind of grow and businesses grow and different. Groups uh, move and we infill. Is there a way that we can uh, be proactive in making sure we are uh, living happy together? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I think that I'll attempt to deal with that particular question. The um, odor is, would be controlled, I think, to the best of our ability on both um, uh, both private and commercial properties, both residential and commercial properties, through our clean yards bylaw. It does address uh, issues of odor, and it could be for more than just from garbage. Uh, another one we often deal with is with dog feces. Uh, but it's the same uh, concept in that odors emanating from a property can be dealt with through our clean yards bylaw. So that would be the tool that we would be attempting to utilize for an issue of odor emanating from a property, regardless of the cost. Okay, that's what we can. I guess this would be for uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, so Monday the 8th, we get to witness something that it's a once in a lifetime thing in the uh, solar eclipse that is coming about. Now we're not in the area where, where we can benefit the totality, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is something. So, and I know often we sit here and we reach to the to the converted when we're trying to ask people to save, play it safe. Buckle your seatbelt, turn your headlights on, don't bring a drive. Uh, but I would like to cheat uh, to, to speak about the dangers of looking directly at, at the sun. We've all been warned uh, when there is a with the eclipse that's coming on. And is there anything planned or is there any? I mean, a lot of school boards decided to change PA days uh, for a safety set for April the 8th. Uh, is there anything happening in town uh, with regard to the, the total the, the solar eclipse? Through you, Mr. Mayor, my public service announcement is a little bit different than Ms. McNamara. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the most important thing to do is never go directly at the sun. And that doesn't matter whether it's all the folks or not, all the clips. And I would like to think that we would instruct everyone within our family circle and our friend circle and the public that you should not be looking directly at the sun. Now, I do understand that it might be possible during a total eclipse or even a partial eclipse because I believe we're in the 90% uh, area. So that's fairly significant still. We're still going to have a fairly significant event in this area. Um, there are many methods that you can utilize to safely view a eclipse. When I was uh, in, in elementary school, we all built boxes with tin foil and uh, had holes poked in them and were able to view the, the total eclipse that occurred in 1979 or whenever that was uh, in that method. I would encourage people to, um, this might be a place where you know you want to be careful about Google sometimes, but I think there would be a number of very um, cool ways that a family could partake in the total eclipse in a safe manner. We will be doing uh, public service announcements through our social media feeds coming up, just reminding everyone that it's not a good idea to ever walk directly at the sun and uh, encouraging them to find safe ways to participate in this. This is a uh, real life science experiment. And I think for um, all kids, they should be participating in some fashion. And I hope that they can do that when they're having a day off rather than uh, being at school and learning of these things in the classroom. So this is a quote to the web page, don't touch. So that's good. So is, are there any safety concerns for the community at large? Uh, you know, there were, I read some interesting stuff about how, where you get that totality where, uh, you know, the birds stop singing and autonomous animals come out and it's just, it was kind of a real serene, you know, kind of, on a kind of a different dimension for what I guess about 10 minutes, I suppose. But through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm just going to repeat, we should never anyone be looking at the sun without some protection on your mind. So that's the safety message that has to go to everyone. And I don't think we'll have zombies walking the street and, and, <laughs> and drive with your legs. <laughs> okay. 
I think that's enough questions for tonight. Um, <laughs> for courts, we start with California College. <clears throat> Thank you, Worship. Um, I didn't have a lot going on, but I did take in the uh, Hockey Day and Gary Sound event on the weekend. Um, and I would like to uh, commend everyone that was involved, uh, Rotary Club, Linda West, Rick Hayden. Um, they really pulled together a hell of an event. Um, and with their sponsors and the players and, and businesses that took place. Um, so I just like to say bravo to all that were involved. And I did manage to snag uh, one of the clerks an autograph on a, on a leaf jersey. So that was a plus for me. And to take in the game with my son. So um, yeah, it was a great event. I think for the town, we had great weather considering it was March 30th and uh, there's festivities downtown. Um, so yeah, it's a great day. That's in my Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Worship. Good evening, everyone. On March 27th, I attended the Board of Man Management meeting at Belvedere. Uh, we are continuing to roll out our quality improvement plan. Um, there have been a number of surveys taken with residents and families of residents, two that caught my eye in particular, where 95% uh, of residents and families. Uh, Indicate that they recommend Belvedere to others, and over 90% believe that when they express concerns, uh, they have no fear of reprisal and generally appropriate actions are taken in a timely fashion. So I commend the staff and management for engaging with the residents and the families in this regard. I think that's uh, what we would hope and expect in a facility where we're housing our most vulnerable uh, residents. And uh, I too want to congratulate the Rotary Club, Linda and Rick and their swarm of volunteers, including uh, our number of members of our fire department. And I want to commend the uh, staff at the DOCC. There, there was, I, I'm not sure that there's been a day when there's been more traffic in and out of that building, uh, a larger crowd for a hockey game or any other event, but they managed it seamlessly. Uh, they pulled it off uh, without incident or, or event. I think everyone in attendance enjoyed themselves. And it was, uh, as I said, the last time where and we approved the uh, use of the building that but it really is for a, a good community cause that uh, anyone who chooses to will benefit from it. So thank you to the, our folks for their commitment to this. And that's my report for this evening. Thank you. Councilor McCann. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, fellow councilors, staff, and public. Uh, Thursday afternoon, I was uh, walking by the uh, new site, the future site for the Westbury Sound Recreation and Culture Center, and it was exciting to see uh, the excavation the equipment on site uh, and doing and, and moving dirt around. <laughs> so, I mean, this really makes it real. And it looks like, and it seems like a humble beginning, but we know this story goes way back to the early 2000s. Numerous individuals, with vision, with commitment, passion, fundraising, various committees got together looking for funding, looking for locations. So a humble start it may look like, but indeed it's a huge, huge project. And, and in our lifetime, we get to see this come true. So I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, uh, so that was that was cool. Um, I, I just I had no meetings to report on this. This, this time around, but I did want to uh, take this opportunity to remind folks of a, a special celebration of lives that's coming up uh, at the end of this month. Uh, people will recall the, uh, the passing of Wayne Formula on November 14th of last year. Uh, Wayne and his wife had relocated there in 2019. They lived some 50 years, pretty sadly. Angie, who had been suffering from declining health, only lived 81 days after Wayne uh, passed away. So with the couple's uh, unending love, support, and contributions to the West Perry Sound area, they left an indelible mark on this area. No one would, would argue that. So anyhow, um, 
It's been written and said that for most anyone involved or benefiting from the likes of growth and development, including commercial and industrial skills training, fundraising, community support systems, and such, uh, should know that either Wayne or Angie had something to do with it. So uh, the public is invited uh, to honor and remember Angie. Uh, with the celebration of their lives well lived. It's going to be held on April the 28th. It's a Sunday afternoon from 2 to 5 at the uh, Mike Tomable Community Hub in the Carlin Township Center. You'll hear more about this later. Uh, but again, I just wanted to remind the public that they are invited to come out. It looks like it's going to be a, a wonderful celebration of two uh, uh, extraordinary people. So that's April 28th, Mark that. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Golaski. Thank you, Your Worship. I there was two meetings of Belvedere, which I am un unable to attend, so my report will be submitted tonight. Thanks. Councillor Ashton. Uh hello everyone. Um I think uh it, there's been a lot of development over the last few years in the area of mental health. I think sometimes there's a feeling that there hasn't been because changes are big and they're broad uh, because our world is big and broad. And I just wanted to point a few out today in my report uh, that I've come across over the last uh, while. Um, one, one of the big ones for all of us is uh, the 988 number. Um, to call or text that number, their slogan is, uh, you deserve to be heard and we're here to listen. Uh, that's something that's fairly new uh, going in for, for the communities in Ontario. And I encourage anybody, it, it might seem crazy just to be a number to call, uh, it might not seem like enough, but it's a really good start. So uh, when you think that there's not a situation or there's not something out there or there hasn't been something done, think about that number. Um, our own local hospital, West Prairie South Hospital, has created a mental health hub. And it's been a lot of work and a lot of time uh, and a lot of different organizations working together to try to fix the cracks in, in our mental health system. Um, you can call the hospital, just say, you can talk to the hub. It's best to do that before there's an emergency, right? If, if you're in an emergency situation, you're at 911, 988. But if you, anytime during the day, give a call to that hub and say, what do I do? How do I get help? Um, the extension of the hospital is 1339. Uh, but at the same time, you can just call and say, I need to talk to the mental health hub. I need to figure something out. And, and if you're in that situation, it, it's Tons have been done here in that situation five years ago is completely different from today. So please, please reach out to that hub anytime that anytime that something's needed. Uh, and then finally, uh, one of the things that have been done across the province, of which uh, uh, one of our local providers' hands is at the forefront of, is the one stop talk. And this is a, a, a line designed for you. And this is free, you can access it as many times as, it, as you want. And it's a counselor. Uh, it doesn't replace the intake at hands, and you can call hands uh, for mental health for youth, and they have an intake and they have um, programs. Some are emergency, uh, but when you call hands, you will you will get help within 24 hours of calling. Uh, but this is this is something that hands is supporting the province is leading as a new thing uh, as the mental health crisis has has developed. Um, the number is one eight five five four one six eight two five five, or one stop talk. Just Google one stop talk. And the number will be right there, free uh, counseling and service for young people. Um, so I just wanted to bring all that up um, because, because a lot's happening, a lot's changing, a lot's being done um, to make sure that, that, that we're there as a community for people. Uh, the second thing I want to bring up is um, today's a really important day for, for me as a Canadian and an Ontarioite. Um, it's uh, the it's day that, that uh, Pope John Paul II passed away in 2005. And Canada and Ontario both got together and they declared today John Paul II Day. And the principal reason was because he is a supporter of peace. And he did a bunch of work at, at, uh, for peace over his time with uh, communism, all kinds of different things that he experienced as, as a Polish person, uh, but then also as a world leader. And I want to bring that up again because I think it's, it's, uh, he's an he's a inspiration in my life and has guided me as a a community-oriented person throughout my time, but I also think it's something that we really need to hear as a society right now, because I think we're all being affected by that quite a bit. So every April 2nd, uh, it's a nice little reminder for me to think back and say, uh, uh, look back at that declaration that Ontario and uh, uh, the Canadian government took um, to declare John Paul II day, and just a reminder that it's principally about peace. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Key. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, fellow councilors, staff, and the public. I would just add to um, Councilor Ashford's comment regarding uh, mental health. The OPP and the town did assist in, in the grant in filling out the you know, forms, et cetera, for the grant. The OPP also have a mental health worker that uh, rides along in the car for crisis situations. So this is going to be the first year of that. There's other areas in the process. Office. We've had that for a while, but this will be the first year stats will be obtained. So we are very lucky in the West Ferguson District to now have this worker because it certainly makes an impact in them going to hospital uh, when there's an issue and in, in the community. So that's really great. The activities that I've done uh, in the past two weeks. First of all, I had what I call a fun in that I went along, uh, it was called a ride along and delivery uh, meal on wheels. And uh, that was a great experience. It was a valuable experience. Uh, I got to meet different uh, people, help me deliver uh, the meals. And I'm afraid that I knew quite a bit of people. So it seems that with my driver and me along, it took a little longer because I flattened the tongue lots. Then uh, a turnaround a committee of adjustment. I attended the committee of adjustment, and there were two applications approved, as well as the land acknowledgement, which was also approved. I attended the retirement dinner for, well, Ann Herdman, who had been the cemetery administrator for many years. Uh, she's uh, worked a, a good length of time for a municipality, and I think she will be missed, uh, judging by all the uh, uh, staff that turned up and uh, friends of hers, et cetera, to uh, provide well wishes as long as, as well as an uh, acrylic painting, uh, which was uh, done by a local artist. So it was a nice opportunity to give her recognition. I attended the uh, breakfast, uh, uh, European breakfast actually at the Rotary Club um, this past uh, Saturday to help with the fundraising. That was great. And I also attended the uh, Easter egg hunt, and I uh, did not try to go and find any Easter eggs, but I have to say that that was sponsored, uh, certainly in collaboration with the Perry Sound Friendship Center. And it was a great opportunity because out at the Kinsman Park, the uh, kids were involved with coloring on, on papers and there were uh, drawings on what would have been the uh, cement of the former ice surface and uh, there was also face painting and there were a ton of kids in different sections running around and going to search for easter eggs and i saw a lot of happy uh, children and i'm sure later on in the day they probably were very active with all that chocolate i also attended the downtown business association saturday in the afternoon and i thought it was really great the sport the activities that were there on James Street that uh, children and adults could be involved in a family situation where you could uh, play a variety of games, including car uh, curling was for an example. So that I thought that they did a really good job. If I go back uh, to that Easter egg hunt, I have to also say the fire department was there. They were doing a fine job keeping those fires uh, uh, going on and also putting them out and also uh, the staff that was involved, the uh, BOCC staff, uh, did a fine job too. So it was a, a good time, I felt, uh, by all. Uh, today, uh, I completed an Indigenous cultural competency course that was sponsored by the Association of Municipalities Ontario. Uh, this took me uh, some hours to complete. It was a, a good learning experience uh, for me, and so I'm grateful that I was able to uh, attend that, and the taxpayers were paying for it, so I thank you for that. In reference to what we, uh, there's been some discussion already about the eclipse, there is another way of looking at it, which I think there was a brief comment, but I think when that eclipse comes, instead of people maybe uh, wanting to see the eclipse themselves, because with the technology that we have now, we know between the news, between uh, 
other uh, much more sophisticated uh, means of photographing that, one can actually uh, go about it the opposite way and see how dark they, you know, when they hopefully are sitting in the dark between 3 and 3.30, that they can use their ears and see what they can hear and see if they notice anything different without looking at the sun at all, because I think that would be another experience to tell us uh, things in nature and how they change. And finally, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Ms. McNamara's uh, comment about uh, this uh, Sunday coming up, which is uh, paint winter goodbye. I know it was an idea last year that I, I really encouraged and was grateful that council and the BOC start, um, were supportive of. And I hope, because there was a good turnout last year of parents and kids, that we will even have more parents and kids coming out on that ice and painting the lawn because it's certainly an activity that people can get have a little fun with and uh, again uh, expend some of their energy. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council, Staff, and Public. March 21st to March 22nd, the AMO Executive Committee as a whole on board meetings in Toronto. Uh, I would also, also I'd like to thank the Tim and Tim and Kathy Dyer for putting on the White Squall event. Uh, that was held to raise money for the new wellness center and pool. Um, I believe they raised over $20,000 from, from that event. So your efforts are very much appreciated. Uh, certainly thank you to them, sponsors, volunteers, and uh, those that participated in the event. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. March uh, 26th, there was a special pool committee meeting. March 27th, they attended the Horticultural Society meeting at the Stocking Center. Good number of members, and I really have to commend them and thank them for the work that they do in the community, uh, keeping the gardens uh, tended and making the place look good and bringing a smile to people's faces. So March 30th, I uh, attended the Hockey Day in Perry Sound. Saturday was a very busy day in Perry Sound. I'd like to begin by thanking the DBA uh, for all their work downtown to create a family entertainment environment for uh, the children and uh, just a, a nice atmosphere downtown, very welcoming. And I'd also like to thank the Rotary Club, uh, Linda West and her, her crew for organizing the Hockey Day in Perry Sound and getting the Toronto Maple Leaf alumni uh, hockey team here. To all the volunteers, sponsors, thank you for your support. It took a lot of people to run this event. And, you know, for some of the food uh, in the evening, the, there was a group of Ukrainians put the uh, um, food together, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the, the Maple Leaf alumni team members were very giving of their time to those who attended the various events. And the, I know they were... They had a windrow of them set up there for signing autographs. Um, you know, there was hockey sticks, jerseys, uh, brochure, like the brochure, uh, whatever. Um, it was it was great to see, and, and people really appreciated that. It was also great to see the stands full in the arena and uh, the other venues upstairs as well. So, as Councilor Borman mentioned, it was packed. Um, there was uh, it was a great game, a lot of fun, and I want to thank uh, the, the players, the team uh, that, that that played on the Perry Sound team. Um, thank you, Council Borderman, for coaching, uh, being part of the coaching team for that, um, which was was great. And uh, it was truly a great day and a great event. And thank you to everyone who bought tickets and participated. And yes, it is very exciting to see the groundwork starting for the new Recreation and Culture Center. It is really good. I've been taking a few pictures and sending them to Ms. Johnson so that there's a little bit of a history or whatever at the beginnings, at least. Well, I remember to do that. When it, it, it made quite an impact when all of a sudden they cleared the trees and you could see the subdivision in behind. It was uh, something to see. So anyway, that's my report. On with the agenda. So moved by Councillor McCann, second by Councillor Barnum. 
You need to drink the water part way too. This one. Oh, sorry, Councilman McDonald. Yeah, and the second by Council Gorman. Whereas both the federal government and the province of Ontario have identified housing as a top priority in municipalities across the province. Whereas most small urban municipalities are economic hubs serving an area much larger than their respective municipality. Whereas they provide the infrastructure essential to the delivery of a wide range of business, economic, social, and education services, as well as a range of housing options that benefit the surrounding municipalities. Whereas the surrounding municipalities that benefit from those services do so without contribution to the infrastructure costs, which are entirely borne by small urban municipalities. Whereas smaller municipalities face increased social and fiscal pressures as a result of providing infrastructure in support of those services. Whereas this results in the small urban municipalities having disproportionately higher cost structures as compared to more rural municipalities. Whereas these services made available in smaller urban municipalities also leads to a much higher proportion of their assessment base being exempt from property taxation. Whereas these factors, when combined, to result in significantly higher property taxes in smaller municipalities compared to neighboring municipalities. Whereas criteria used in federal and provincial funding programs doesn't effectively distinguish between the needs of these smaller municipalities compared to other municipalities. Whereas the most cost effective and timely way to increase the housing supply is to leverage existing urban infrastructure through infill development. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the provincial and federal governments be requested to review their funding program criteria with the objective of providing a greater focus on funding infrastructure in small urban municipalities. And that the provincial and federal governments continue to work together to coordinate infrastructure funding to ensure the optimum return on their combined infrastructure investments. That as a part of that, as a part of that coordination, the provincial and federal governments undertake a third party review. To determine how all levels of government can be assured their infrastructure investments deliver the optimum return on investment in a timely manner, and smaller municipalities responsible for such infrastructure are proportionately appropriately incentivized for taking on such significant risks, and that this resolution be forwarded to the federal minister of housing, infrastructure, and communities, provincial minister of finance, the minister of municipal affairs and housing, minister of infrastructure. MP Scott Aitchison, MPP Greg Smith, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, Ontario Smaller Municipalities, also, and the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities, Canal. I wonder if we should put SCN in there as well. Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Maybe we could add that. Should I do? Okay. Discussion. Council Barnum. Well, some will say that we're whistling into the wind uh, <laughs> here, but uh, you know, I've been beating Mr. Harris up to bring something like this forward for a couple of months because uh, you know it's it's apparent to me that uh, status quo isn't working, and uh, you know, at the end of the, the day. Uh, the province and the feds need to reassess their their funding programs for this uh, for infrastructure. I think that uh, the targets that have been set are, are pretty much unattainable. But if we're to get anywhere near the housing targets that the premier coordinators have suggested, uh, something has to happen. Something fundamental has to happen to allow us to to. Uh, Put our best foot forward and do do what we can to uh, to achieve those targets. It kind of aggravates me when I see ministers running about the province in large urban centers handing out uh, multi million dollar checks because somebody's exceeded their targets, and we can't get support for uh, you know the basic infrastructure that's required to uh, to allow us to move forward in time and not create urban sprawl at the same time. Directly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Mr. Harris. Just uh, through the chair, and, and uh, in addition to what Councillor Barton said, you know one of the issues is uh, not 
every government grant is used the same formula, but a lot of the formulas include households, the number of households. So if you have a community of cottage community, cottage municipality, their household account could be the same as a small urban municipality's housing account, yet the needs are significantly different. But they, through the formulas, they get the same allocation. So this is trying to take a look at that allocation and it, it should make sense. And, and if you're trying to grow uh, great housing, uh, where this resolution says focus on infill, add to what already exists and expand and build upon that rather than, uh, you know, giving it just based on actions. So a little bit more thought to that at all. Any further questions? No? Okay. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Moved by Councilor McDonald, second by Councilor Borneman, that the 2023 statement of remuneration. Paid to council and appointed board members attached to Schedule A be accepted. Any discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moved by Councillor McDonald and seconded by Councillor McCann. Whereas autism spectrum disorder, ASD, affects more than 135,000 Ontarians and is now recognized as the most common neurological disorder affecting one in every 66 children, as well as their friends, family, and community. And whereas ASD not only manifests itself differently in every individual in whom it appears, but its characteristics will change over the life of each individual as well. And whereas Autism Ontario is dedicated to increasing public awareness about autism and the day-to-day -day issues faced by individuals with autism, their families, and the professionals whom they interact. Now, therefore, the Council of Corporation of Town of Perry Sound hereby declares April 2nd, 2024, as World Autism Day in the Town of Perry Sound. Any discussion? All in favor? And carried. Moved by Council McCann, second by Council Borneman. The pursuant to bylaw 2019-69-12 was amended, which permits Council to grant an exemption from the time limited parking regulations as set out in section 4.5 of the bylaw. And upon the request of the Perry Sound Seniors Club 1269, Council hereby grants exemption to the Perry Sound Seniors Club 1269 from the timeline parking regulations as set out in section 4.5. A parking bylaw 2019-69-12 on Saturday, April 20th, 2024, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., pertaining to the west side of James Street from McMurray Street to Rosetta Street home. Any discussion? All in favor? Let's carry it. Moved by Councillor Ashford, second by Councillor Keith, that bylaw number 2024 7400 being the bylaw to approve the development charge of DC deferral policy for the corporation of the town of Perry Sound to be considered as read the first time. All in favor? And that's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? It's carried. Moved by Councillor Ashford, second by Councillor Keith, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time. Past signed and sealed. Is there staff person that wants to be appointed? Okay. Mr. Harris. Yeah, uh, through the uh, through to the mayor. Uh, Ms. Phillips and I have worked on this uh, DC deferral policy. We brought a draft policy back in February. The intent was to put it on the agenda and see if there's any comments coming from the public or members of the development industry in the area. Uh, we got uh, one one comment. DC deferral policies are not uncommon. Uh, where you tend to see deferral policies and where this policy 
applies is high density development. If you use the example of a subdivision, you come in and can take out a building permit, one building, one unit at a time, and you pay the DCs, you sell that house, and you go on and build another one. If you had a 40 unit uh, high density condominium building, then you've got to pay the DCs on those 40 units up front. So the idea of referring <clears throat> DCs to a later date, you're not you're not uh, negating the payment, you're just deferring them to a later date, is, is as, as I mentioned, is a common practice. Um, the comments that we got in, we got one comment, and they we were securing us. If we're going to defer payment from building permit issuance, building permit issuance is, is guaranteed payment. People don't pay the appropriate charges, they don't get a building permit. That's it. You can't get a much better incentive. When you defer payment beyond the building permit issuance, so the individual has their permit, then you still want to ensure collection. You don't want it to become a burden on the taxpayers. So they requested if it's a condominium, uh, that we not require a letter of credit to secure that future payment. We discussed that with legal advice, and there is the uh, we can pull registration of the condominium, and that's some pretty good leverage as well. Uh, we also changed the security to give some flexibility to the treasurer uh, to accept different security other than perhaps a letter of credit uh, for. Uh, or payment of DCs in the condominium situation. The rate and effect, we changed that from the original uh, <clears throat> the original uh, draft policy set. That you, you get to lock in your rate when you enter into the agreement, and then we would charge you interest because you didn't pay on when the date was due, you would charge you interest. Uh, the individual that uh, provided comments didn't want interest. So we thought, well, let's just make the rate payable the day when the payment is due, i.e. condominium registration, by example, and there's no interest. Because we're, by then, over the two years, the rate, the DC rate would have been indexed and indexed higher, so they would pay a higher rate, but they're not sure of interest. So we think that we've addressed the concerns that were raised uh, by the, uh, the comments that were received and uh, before you were through. Council Barnett. No, I just want to thank Mr. Harris and Ms. Phillips for, for getting this back to us. It, it, you know, is it a deal breaker? I hope not. Is it an incentive? I hope so. If, if we can, uh, you know, put the message out that uh, we're willing to work with people, I, I think that's a uh, a positive for the community rather than making every inch uh, a battle. So yeah. thank you for your time and effort in this instance. Okay. Any further further? All in favor then? Let's carry it. By Councilor Ashley, Secretary Council Keith, the bylaw number 2024 7408 being the bylaw authorized the execution of the agreement with Science North for the delivery of education based lead camp programming be considered as read the first time. All in favor? Carried. All members in favor having the second third reading? Carried. Moved by Councilor Ashley, second by Councilor Keith. But the bylaw above mentioned be concerned as right a second, third time by the sign and seal. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Ms. McNamara, you've been patiently waiting on the line. Is there anything you want to add to this? 
Thank you, Mayor Garvey. Through your worship, the town of Perry Sound and staff have worked really hard with um, Science North to form um, a really positive relationship that benefits the resident of the town of Perry Sound, whereby Science North comes in, works with town staff to deliver quality programming for children and youth um, over the summer months. We don't have a day camp anymore, and they're coming in to assist us and offer a really cool STEM program to the residents. Thank you, Mayor McCarty. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Councilor Keith? Yes, thank you. Uh, the question has to do with Ms. McNamara, uh, with uh, those um, whatever organizations or members that will not be able to use the VOCC during that time. Has there been any way of accommodating that given the uh, value valuability of this program? For your worship, um, unfortunately, due to uh, facility restraints, um, both two regular scheduled programs, one being shuffleboard, the other being floor curling, <clears throat> will be canceled um, for the duration of this program. This program is a little less than two weeks in duration and will take place after the August long weekend um, until August 12th, or and sorry, until August 16th. Okay. All in favor? Yeah, carry. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Golovsky, seconded by Councillor Key, that bylaw number 2024-7410, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Georgia Bay Airways for the lease of Walter Lot located between Georgia Bay Airways property and the town dock, which is the way the first one. All in favor? Very All members in favor of having second and third reading. Carried. Moved by Councilor Gillespie, second by Councilor Keith. The bylaw above mentioned be considered through the second and third time passed on the city. Any discussion? Councilor McCann. Perhaps maybe just for the benefit of the public's uh, knowledge, some of the experience. Keep going. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the Georgia Bay Airways water law lease is for the space that's immediately between the town dog and the tailwind restaurant. Uh, this uh, water lot is owned by the town. It also extends a little bit to the front of Tailwind, where they uh, generally will park an airplane. This has been before council in the recent past when there was a uh, extension of this particular lease to include the airplane docking dockage. So this right now is coming before you for a new three-year lease. Thank you. Thank you. Council Bond, you have a question? I, not a question, it's a statement. Uh, this is a heck of a deal for all of these, uh, these lease rates, in my humble opinion. <laughs> yeah, well, we got a few of them. Council Keith, do you have a question? No? Okay. Anything else then? All in favor? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Keith, second by Councillor Ashford, that bylaw number 2024 7411 being a bylaw authorized the execution of agreement with Perry Sound Cruise Lines for the lease of, lease of property LT 6 21 PL 154. Perry Sound be considered with the first time. All in favor? Uh, it's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings? Carried. By Councillor Keith and second by Councillor Asher, that the bylaw above mentioned is considered the second and third time past Sunday. This is basically another water law um, rental. 
Um, any questions? All in favor then? That's carried. Oh, moved by Councilor Bornem and seconded by Councilor McCann that bylaw number 2024-7412 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a lease with Chandler Bargain Limited for the use of the property identified as lot 2 plan 155 being part of uh, plan 22R9587, lot 3 plan 166, lot 4 plan 166 in the following town of Ferry Sound. Be considered as ready first time. All in favor? Carried. All members in favor of having second and third readings? Yeah. Carried. Moved by Council McCann, second by Council Barnum, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read a second and third time, passed, signed, and sealed. Any discussion? Again, it's another week, right? <clears throat> All in favor then? All carried. <clears throat> Moved by Councilor Keith, second by Councilor Bolosky, the bylaw number 2024-7409 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a lease, uh, sorry, a licensed occupation with sound boat works for the use of property down the Dallas Park Water Block, <coughs> west of Mill Street, totally as in Perry, PS 8343, except PT 1142R6597 and Part 4, 22R, 11, 471, Ferry Sound, if we consider it there the first time. All in favor? And it's carried. All members in favor of having second third readings? And it's carried. Um, moved by Councilor Bolesky, second by Councilor Keith, that the bylaw above mentioned be considered as read the second third time. Fast sign and seal. Um, Is there any difference, Mr. Thompson, between a license of occupation and the previous one that we did? Mr. Mayor, uh, no, generally there isn't any difference between the license of occupation and with this one. It is most directly related to the uh, Georgia Bay Airways. That's simply a difference in the period of when these were developed. And when the lawyers reviewed them, they wanted different terminology used, and you just carried those forward. Uh, the Sound Boat Works is much older uh, yes. uh, than the uh, the Georgian Bay Airways one. The other two are more like leases because they actually have uplands attached to them. Uh, so they are slightly different than just the pure water law ones, but simply a function of timing when you legal reviews occurred in the language that they wanted to use when they reviewed it at that time. Okay. I wondered when I saw that, I wondered whether there was any. Okay, good. Hey, Council Ken. Well, just, it mentioned sound bolt works. Is this something that's on the other side? Or is it all in the same area that we discussed? Out in the too. Yes. Right, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. yeah, no, okay. That's right. my question. <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I just want to make a comment. It seems uh, mm -hmm. the other bylaws that were passed really it was a three-year uh, period that we were extending, and yet this one it, it's a five-year period. And I, I'm real. I realize that the report says uh, there is no at this site. Um, there doesn't seem to be any concerns, and uh, and uh, having it five years, it doesn't look like there's. Something else is going to be, shall we say, developed or whatever within the five years. But I'm just thinking for consistency if we have three years, because there's, uh, you never know what's going to happen down the road with our water current. But that wouldn't be really consistent because everything will be three years. Can I have a comment, please? Chief Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When these were last brought to council, we actually tried to create a consistent time frame so that they were all coming back at once, which is what you're seeing right now. What we identified when we reviewed them this time is there's actually three different time frames out of the four of them. 
the Seaboom Park Act, we're only suggesting for a two year period. Um, that's because staff thinks that through the waterfront master planning process, there is a realistic um, a realistic idea that there may be a repurposement of that particular site with regards to the uh, Georgian Bay Airways and the Chandler uh, boat or the Chandler barging. We didn't want to go beyond three years. Well, everyone would like to go for a longer time frame. I should clarify this. All the applicants would like to have a longer time frame. With the two um, being Georgia Bay Airways and Chandler Barging, although they would like to go for a longer time frame, uh, we weren't comfortable in committing to that, mainly due to when's the redevelopment or when is there going to be redevelopment of the Bay Street property. Uh, there's announcements coming from MNR soon. We're expecting, as we have been in the past, that there might be some movement in the near future within those properties, and we didn't want to tie down the municipality too long. Sound Boatworks, as similar to all the rest, asked for a longer period of time. From the staff review, we couldn't see of any other purpose for where the Sound Boatworks water lot is, where they're utilizing that water, that water lot. That is a very extremely large water lot, and it gives them the rights to the area that they have currently, uh, not to additional rights within the larger part of that water lot. So we felt that there was no harm in entering into or recommending that we enter into a longer time frame for that particular um, that particular water lot because we were already starting to throw off the time frame of having them all come back to council together, anyways. So. That's how we came up with the time frames and that are being presented to you and we're recommending. Thank you. Anything further? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moved by Council of Can, second by Council of Oregon, that bylaw number 2024-7413, being the bylaw to point to Grant, Schwartz and Truver, and Margaret Lawson as building officials be considered as right of first time. All in favor? That's carried. All members in favor of having the second and third readings. And that's carried. Moved by Council of Barnum, second by Council of McCann, the file of both mentioned be considered as read a second and third time pass on the seal. Council of McCann. Well, it's great. Andrew Mayor has been sitting patiently all evening long, so we should really give him a chance to, to uh, speak of it. Well, tell us about the uh, these appointments. <clears throat> Thanks, and through your worship. Um, this is basically just a uh, in addition of inspectors as required by uh, the Ontario Building Code Act. Uh, in this particular case, um, I requested and received uh, an updated proposal from our building code consultant that's doing a uh, review on a couple of our required projects, in particular the, uh, the pool and rec center. Um, and within the proposal, they identified two new uh, inspectors uh, on their staff that we hadn't yet appointed um, last year. So this is more just a formality to make sure that they're part of our inspection officer to make it legal. Thank you. I wanted to take you to learn how to pronounce Brent's last name. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else from anybody? Yeah. All in favor? Uh, carried. Thank you. Moved by Councilor McDonald, second by Councilor Gorneman, the file on the 2024-7414, because being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council be considered as read at first time. All in favor? That's carried. 
Council meeting, the next meeting of Council from Town of Perry Sound is scheduled for Tuesday, April 9th at 7 p.m. That's the operating budget. And this meeting will be held at the Town of Perry Sound Council Chambers at 52 Seaton Street, entrance via Beautiful Street, be live streamed and recorded. All regular meetings of Council are held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday of each month, except January and August, where only one regular meeting is scheduled. The council meeting schedule, notices of special council meetings, complete agendas and minutes, and instructions on accessing the live stream and recorded council meetings are all posted on the town's website. Go to www.perryson.ca and use the search bar. Your TV airs council meetings on Saturday at 9.30 a.m. following the regular council meeting. And for code for listings, contact www.yourtv.tv. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. So, um, well, uh,